we have become familiar with temporal justice, which has its seat in the state as either retributive or punitive. And we have seen that this becomes justice only when it takes the future into account. Any punishment or retribution for an outrage is unjustifiable if it lacks reference to the future. It only compounds the first evil by adding a second that lacks any sense or significance. But the situation is entirely different with eternal justice, which we mentioned earlier, and which governs the world, not the state. It is not dependent on human institutions, not subject to chance or deception, not uncertain, unstable or subject to error, but rather infallible, steadfast and secure. The concept of retribution already entails temporality, which is why eternal justice cannot be retributive, as this would require time. It cannot permit any delays or reprieves, nor can it appeal to time to balance a bad deed with a bad result. Punishment must be tied to the offense, to the point where the two become one. The world in all the multiplicity of its parts and forms is the appearance the objecthood of the one will to life. Existence itself, as well as the mode of existence, in the whole and each of the parts, all comes from the will alone. It is free, it is omnipotent. The will appears in everything, precisely as it determines itself, in itself, and outside of time. The world is only the mirror of the willing, in all finitude, all suffering. All the misery the world contains belongs to the expression of what it wills. It is so because the will wills it so. Thus, with the strictest right, every being supports existence in general, both the existence of its species and the existence of its distinctive individuality, just as it is, in its surroundings as they are, in a world as it is, ruled by accident and error, temporal transient, always suffering. And everything that happens to the individual, indeed, everything that can happen, is always right. Because the will is his, and as the will is, so is the world. The responsibility for the existence and the condition of this world can only be borne by the world itself, and no other. For how could anyone else take it upon themselves? If you want to know what humanity, morally considered, is worth overall and in general, just look at the fate of humanity overall and in general. It is want, misery, sorrow, trouble, and death. Eternal justice is at work. If human beings were not on the whole worthless, then their fate would not be on the whole so sad. In this sense, we can say the world itself is the world tribunal the last judgment. If we could put all the misery of the world on one side of a scale, and all the guilt of the world on the other, the pointer would certainly vouch for this. But of course the world does not present itself to the cognition of the individual as such a cognition that has arisen from the will in order to serve it, in the same way that it eventually reveals itself to the investigator, that is, as the objecthood of the one and only will to life that he himself is. Instead, the eyes of the crude individual are clouded, as the Indians say, by the veil of Maya. It is not the thing in itself that shows itself to the individual, but only appearances in time and space in the principle of individuation, and in the rest of the forms of the principle of sufficient reason. And in this form of his limited cognition, he does not see the essence of things, which is one, but rather only appearances, which are separated, disconnected, innumerable, highly dissimilar, and in fact opposed. Thus pleasure appears to him to be one thing, and sorrow something entirely different. This human being appears as a torturer and murderer. That person a martyr and victim. Evil is one thing and trouble another. He sees one person living in happiness, abundance and pleasure, 
while at the same person's door another is dying a miserable death from want and cold. Then he asks, where is retribution? And he himself, in the most violent urges of the will, that is his origin and his essence, seizes the pleasures and delights of life, embraces them firmly, and does not know that through this very act of his will he is seizing and clutching to himself all the pains and miseries of life, the very sight of which strikes him with such terror. He sees the trouble, he sees the evil in the world, but he's very far from recognizing that both are only different sides of the single appearance of the one will to life. He considers them very different, in fact entirely opposed, and often tries to escape trouble, his own individual suffering through evil, that is by causing other people to suffer. Trapped as he is in the principle of individuation, deceived by the veil of Maya. Just as the captain sits in a boat, trusting the weak little vessel, as the raging boundless sea raises up and casts down howling cliffs of waves, so the human individual sits calmly in a world full of sorrow, supported by and trusting in the principle of individuation, which is how the individual cognizes things as appearance. The boundless world, everywhere full of suffering, with its infinite past and infinite future, is alien to him. In fact, it is a fairy tale. His vanishing little person, his unextended present, his momentary comfort, these alone have reality for him. And he does everything he can to maintain these as long as a more adequate cognition does not open his eyes. Until then, he has only an utterly dark presentiment in the innermost depths of his consciousness that all of this is not really foreign to him, but in fact connected with him in such a way that the principle of individuation cannot protect him. From this presentiment comes that indelible dread shared by all humans, and perhaps even the more intelligent animals. And that seizes them so suddenly when some chance event leaves them in confusion about the principle of individuation, when the principle in some one of its forms seems to have suffered an exception. For instance, if it seems that some alteration has taken place without a cause, or a dead person has returned, or the past or the future are somehow present in any other way, or the distant is near, this sort of thing gives people a tremendous fright because they are thrown into sudden confusion over the forms of cognition of appearances, which is the only thing keeping their own individuality separate from the rest of the world. But this separation itself lies only in appearance, and not in the thing in itself, which is precisely the basis for eternal justice. In fact, all temporal happiness stands on ground that has been undermined, and all prudence wanders over the same ground. These protect the person from mishaps and supply him with pleasures, but the person is mere appearance, is distinction from other individuals, and his freedom from their sufferings are both based on the form of appearance, the principle of individuation. From the perspective of the true nature of things, everyone must regard all the sufferings of the world as his own. In fact, he must regard all merely possible suffering as actual, so long as he is the steadfast will to life, that is, so long as he affirms life with all his strength. For cognition that sees through the principle of individuation, a happy life in time, as a gift of chance or effect of prudence in the midst of the sufferings of countless others, all this is just a beggar dreaming he is king a dream from which he must awake to discover that it was only a fleeting illusion that had separated him from the suffering of his life. Eternal justice will always elude an outlook ensnared in cognition that follows the principle of sufficient reason the principle of individuation. This outlook will miss eternal justice entirely, 
unless it is salvaged through something like a fiction. Such an outlook sees evil people who commit cruelties and atrocities of every sort living happy lives and passing out of the world unchallenged. It sees the oppressed dragging on to the bitter end with lives full of suffering, without avenger or vindicator in sight. But eternal justice will only be understood and grasped by someone who transcends cognition that is guided by the principle of sufficient reason, and bound to individual things, and who recognizes the ideas, sees through the principle of individuation, and becomes aware that the forms of appearance do not apply to things in themselves. This person, by virtue of the same cognition, will be the only one capable of understanding the true essence of virtue, as it will soon be revealed to us in connection with the present line of discussion. Although this cognition, in the abstract, is not necessary at all for the actual practice of virtue. It will be clear to anyone who has achieved such cognition that the will is the in itself of all appearance, and that all the misery imposed on others and experienced by himself, all the evil and the trouble, only ever affect one and the same being. This is true even if two beings present themselves in appearance as entirely different individuals, and even if their appearances are far apart in time and space. He sees that the difference between the one who dishes out suffering and the one who must endure it is only phenomenal and does not concern the thing in itself, which is the will that lives in both. This will is deceived by the cognition that is bound in its service and fails to recognize itself. Trying to increase well-being in one of its appearances, it produces vast amounts of suffering in another, and so, in the violence of his impulses, it sinks its teeth into its own flesh, not knowing that it is only hurting itself, and revealing in this way, through the medium of individuation, its inner conflict with itself. The tormentor and the tormented are one. The former is mistaken in thinking he does not share the torment, the later in thinking he does not share the guilt. If both were made aware of this, the one who imposes the suffering would recognize that he lives in all things that suffer pain in this whole wide world, things that, if endowed with reason, would wonder in vain why they were called into existence for so much suffering, not understanding what is at fault. And the tormented party would see that all evil that is or ever was committed in the world flows from the will that comprises his essence as well, that appears in him as well, and through the appearance and its affirmation. He takes upon himself all the suffering that comes from such a will, and that it is right for him to endure it as long as he is this will. Vivid recognition of eternal justice, of the balancing scale inseparably connecting the evil of the offense with the evil of the punishment, requires a complete transcendence of individuality and the principle of its possibility. Like pure and clear cognition of the essence of all virtue, to which it is related and which will be the next topic of discussion, recognition of eternal justice will always be inaccessible to most people. Thus, the wise forefathers of the Indian people articulated it directly in the Vedas, that is, the esoteric doctrines of wisdom, which are only permitted to the three reborn caste, at least as far as it can be grasped by concepts and language, and their imagistic, rhapsodic manner of presentation allows. But in the folk religion, or exoteric doctrine, the forefathers have communicated it only through myth, we find the direct presentation in the Vedas, the fruit of the highest human cognition and wisdom. The essence of this work has finally come to us in the Upanishads, which are the greatest gift of this century. It is expressed in many forms, but particularly in all the beings of the world, living and lifeless, are led in succession past the gaze of the disciples, while a certain word is pronounced over each of them a word that has become an archetypal formula and as such is called Mahavakya, or more correctly, Tatvamasi, which means you are that. 
This great piece of wisdom is translated for the people, to the extent that they can grasp it, given their limitations, into the sort of cognition that complies with the principle of sufficient reason. Of course, this piece of wisdom, purely and in itself, is completely foreign, even contradictory, to the nature of such cognition. Such cognition cannot accommodate this wisdom. It could only accept a surrogate in the form of myth. Myth was a sufficient guide to action, since it illuminates the ethical meaning of action, albeit through pictorial representation in the manner of cognition that is eternally foreign to this meaning, that is according to the principle of sufficient reason. This is the purpose of religious doctrines, which are all mythological cloaks for truths that are inaccessible to the untutored human senses. We are referring here to the myth of the transmigration of the soul. It teaches you that you must atone for all the suffering you inflict on other creatures over the course of your life by enduring precisely the same suffering in a following life in this very same world. It goes so far to say that anyone who kills even an animal will have to be born at some point in the infinity of time as precisely this sort of animal and suffer the same death. It teaches that wicked behavior will lead to a future life as a suffering and despised creature in this world, being reborn into the lower caste, or as a woman, or an animal, as pariah, or chandala, as a leper, a crocodile, etc. All the misery threatened by this myth is reinforced through real-world perceptions of suffering beings that do not know what they have done to deserve their misery and the myth needs no other hell to support it. But, on the other hand, it promises as a reward that you will be reborn in a better, nobler form, as Brahmin, as sage, as saint. The highest reward that can be expected from the noblest deeds and the fullest resonation, a reward that a woman can also receive after she has freely died on the funeral pyre of her husband in seven successive lives. And that also comes to people whose pure mouths have never spoken a single lie. This reward is something that the myth can express only negatively in the language of this world, through their frequent promise of never being reborn again. You will not assume existence and appearance again, or as it is expressed by the Buddhists, who do not themselves believe in either the Veda or the caste system. You will achieve Nirvana that is a state in which four things are lacking birth, aging, sickness, and death. There has never been and will never be a myth that is bound up so strongly with a philosophical truth accessible to so few as this ancient doctrine of the noblest and oldest of peoples. However degenerate they might now be in many respects, this wisdom in the form of universal folk belief still rules and has decisive influence on life today as much as it had 4,000 years ago. That is why Pythagoras and Plato already admiringly adopted this insurpassable instance of mythic presentation, passed down from India and Egypt, revered it, applied it, and believed it themselves, although we do not know how far their beliefs went. We, on the other hand, send English clergymen and Moravian linner weavers out to the Brahmins, now out of compassion, and want them to know better and to understand that they are made of nothing and should be grateful and pleased about it. But the same thing happens to us that happens to someone who fires a bullet at a rock. Our religions will absolutely never take root in India. The ancient wisdom of the human race will not be displaced by the events in Galilee. On the contrary, Indian wisdom flows back to Europe and will change the very foundations of our knowledge and thought.